Hard Money Lending 101. And we have Ed Gitman from Tower Fund Capital, who has been so gracious to give us his time tonight. He is extremely experienced in this topic, and he's going to cover a lot of the ins and outs of hard money lending, how it differs from traditional lending, how it is you go about it. And for those of us who are real estate agents, I think he's also going to cover how we might be able to earn extra income uh, through some things that they've got going on at Tower from Capital that are really special. So without further ado, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to have some cheap, cheap notes since, you know, I'm getting old and I can't remember what i got to say. But first of all, I'd like to say thank you to all of you to uh, coming out here and I uh, wanted to give you a little bit of uh, history on myself so this way you understand where I'm coming from. I've been on your side of the fence for many, many years. I've been a real estate agent since 1985. I was a real estate broker in 1986. Uh, I actually owned the company next door here, Benjamin Realty, for many years. For those of you that come from Queens, you probably heard of us. And uh, we had eight offices, 450 agents, with 70 uh, support staff. Uh, and we covered the, this area from uh, 1989 to 2007 when I sold the business to Orban Group. And the way, the reason we were able to survive is we triple dipped into every single deal. So what we did was we sold an apartment or a house. We financed it because we owned First Empire Funding. And then we closed every single deal because we later on opened up our own title company, which was called Landmark Abstract. So with that being said, uh, majority of uh, real estate companies, what was happening is that they were collecting their 4 or 5 or 6% commissions in those days. And you know, after you split with a broker, after you split with an agent and whatever gold broken fees you have, you're walking out with about 1.5 to 2% commission. In our case, we're walking out with 6% commission because we charged we got 2% on the sales side, we got 2% on the mortgage side, and then we got another one and three quarters percent on the title side for those of you that are familiar with the title business. So it's kind of um, what, what I'm tr going to try to uh, uh, explain to you today is that everything that I'm going to tell you has got about over 30 years of experience and a lot of mistakes and a lot of success stories. So uh, I assume everybody here is a realtor. We have any investors? No, just realtors. Excellent. So, I don't know if you care about hard money or, or how you're going to make money with hard money. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's really more important to you guys. So, um, let me just take you through a couple of things and uh, go over it. Um, so, a lot of you understand where the hard money came from. The hard money came from it, it, it arose from the need that majority of banks started to tighten up their regulations and underwritings. So what happened was the government came in many years ago and said, if you want to finance either an apartment or a house, you have to have two, two qualifications. One, the borrower has to be qualified, and two, the property has to be qualified. So when you go and you try to sell a property and now you have a borrower that may not be qualified or a property, you have a problem. Uh, the government the government main objection is that we, as licensees, protect the consumer. So what they did was they put in a lot of um, handcuffs on us. They said, you know, if you want to get a regular mortgage, you need to be a W2 employee. Or if you have a 1099, then your rate goes up because it's an uncertainty what you're going to make next year. They also said that you can't finance certain properties. It has to be only a residential property, one to two family, if you want to get a lower rate. Or if you have to be a, a, an owner occupied. So they've put in a lot of roadblocks for you, for the borrower, and for the seller that this business became a very uh, slippery slope. So what happened in the late, um, I would say maybe late 2000s, there's other groups of lenders that came into the picture. And the first group that came in was what we call portfolio lenders. Anybody familiar with portfolio lenders? Somewhat, okay. So a portfolio lender is basically a step above a Fannie Mae or, or Freddie Mac regulations. So what they're doing is they don't have to follow the same underwriting guidelines, but what they do is they don't use their own money. They go out to Wall Street, to hedge funds, to private investors, and they say to them, look, we have a borrower, 
do you have a program for somebody like this? And because it's a hedge fund, what they'll do is they'll hedge the loan against some kind of another financial instrument to make sure that they get their money back. Because they're offering sort of like a modified financing, what they do is they raise the rates. Okay, so now the borrower is paying extra because either himself or the property does not qualify for regular finance. Okay? So that was going on very well until we know we hit all the problems with Wall Street and everybody started to collapse. For those of you that are old enough, you'll remember the 125% financing. And for those of you that are old enough, you remember negative amortization financing. Okay? If you guys remember that, that's great. If you don't remember that, <laughs> even better. <laughs> because this was, this was the nightmare that took everybody down. Okay? The negative amortization was very simple. You paid 1% interest rate, even though the going rate was about 4 or 5. But when you sold the house, you had to make up the difference of 3% a year. It's great when the market goes up every single year, but if you take a hit on the market and the market comes down, guess what? We, what we call in the business is called upside down. Okay? You owe more than it's worth. And what happened? Banks like Dime, Greenpoint, and all likes went out of business and the government had to step in. The 125% financing was another great thing. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of you heard from the business of seller concession. Yeah. So the banks decided they're going to be the seller concessions. So instead of, if you qualified financially, if that apartment is worth or a house $100,000, they gave you $125,000. So day one, you were upside down. It was enticing. The rental market was going down because it was cheaper to own than to rent. There was no balance. And then, as we know the market today, that's what happened. <laughs> so <clears throat> when that market hit and people became upside down, there were two choices that they had. They could either lose the house to a foreclosure, or they can refinance someplace else and sort of put on a band-aid and fix an immediate situation. So that way, in the future, in a year or two or three, they can somehow come out whether their income becomes better, their credit becomes better, the market gets up to par, whatever the case may be. But it, but it was always a wishful thinking, right? Because some, you're always, if you're in trouble, you're always behind the eight ball. There's no such thing. If, you, if you're going, doing great, I mean, the grass doesn't grow under your feet. If you're in trouble, it's always late. So what happened was the hard money guys came in. And at that time, we used to call them shysters. Okay, because what they did was they gave you money at 16, 18, and 20 percent. Um, you signed the paperwork, you signed your life away, they took houses away, and so on. It was totally unregulated. It was totally something new. It was a lot of private money. It was basically Tony, for the lack of a better name, uh, you know, lending to Paul, and that's it. Okay, so this was what we call street money. With time, people understood that hard money could actually be a tool that you can use not only as a band-aid, but the hard money guy, if it's done right, could be the white knight. He can save you from any kind of problem, but also he can be the kind of a person that if you're looking to, let's say, fix and flip, or you're looking to get another investment, okay, what he can do is he can give you equity from something else, or give you a little more equity, and give you the chance to fix the property. So this way you won't have to sell it below market, but you can actually fix it and sell it above the market, or at market price. Okay? So that's really where the hard money came from. Now, hard money in itself has a couple of phases. Okay, and you probably heard in the business banks like Velocity, right? Mm -hmm. So they're one of the largest and we'll use them. Now there's a new bank that came in, Mr. Cooper, I don't know if anybody heard of them. So uh, these banks came in and they said, you know what, we want to get into the hard money business. But because we're not using our own money and we're using again the Wall Street money or any kind of credit lines that are out there from the regular banks, what we're going to do is we're going to be very careful who we give the money to. So they call themselves hard money lenders, but they're really not, okay? A hard, a real, so they ask you for certain paperwork, for certain documents that actually uh, put you in between, you know, uh, a regular bank and, uh, and a hard money. A true hard money lender is basically, it's what we call asset-based lending, 
right? We don't care about anything about you. We don't care about your income, your assets, any kind of other abilities, your credit. Okay? Real hard money people only care about assets. We want to have a collateral that we know we have a secure uh, proof that at the end of the day we're going to get our money back, whether it's going to be in a nice way where you guys are going to sell, or you're going to refinance, or whatever your exit strategy is, or obviously, you know, in a bad way, it goes into the foreclosure, but you still get your money back. So a true hard money lender, is if they're asking more than your one piece of ID and an appraisal, is not a true money lender, okay? It's basically, we're going back again to portfolio lenders or anything in between that, okay? So, um, let me give you a couple of examples um, of lenders, of, of lendings that we've done in the last maybe month, month and a half. And I'm going to give you, the reason I'm going to give you this is because I want you to understand the scenarios. Because everybody's scenario is different. And sometimes people think that hard money is only for people that are in foreclosure or bailouts. It's not true, okay? So I want to go over a couple of properties that, uh, that I think would be important. So I'll give you the addresses and uh, so, for those of you that are familiar with Brooklyn and bed area, it was 101 Holsey Street. We have an investor who, who only went thin on his money. He has three properties that are producing rent and one property that needs to be renovated. He needs about $400,000 to renovate the property. And what happened was he can't pull enough money out of the other properties in order to give to this property to renovate. So he approached us to renovate. We, we gave him money. He's in the midst of renovating. His exit strategy is to establish a rent roll and go out to a regular institution and get financing on that. So that's what we call a fix and flipper that went thin. Okay? So that's one of the scenarios. Um, the other one is in Crown Heights, uh, 1405 Union Street. Now, as you know, banks do not lend to foreign nationals. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a big issue with banks. So this particular gentleman has, happens to be living in Australia. He owns the house in Crown Heights. He gets the rent, or he gets everything, but he couldn't get finance. Okay? So what we did was we gave him the hard money. We actually gave him more of a million dollars because the house is worth, is worth about two. And um, what, what his plan is, is that he established a corporation in New York. And what he's going to do is within the next 12 months, he's going to show that his corporation is active, that it's more than six months in seasoning like the banks require. And what he'll do is he'll figure out how to refinance it to a regular institution or a portfolio lender, but at least he has an established track record of ownership. Okay? So that's another scenario for somebody who's a foreigner. I'm sure in Queens and Brooklyn you guys get a lot of this. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so it's a great way out because we don't ask for seasoned funds, for those of you that heard the words, and we don't ask for proof of funds. So we don't care that you have the money in the bank. If they bring the money to the closing table, it's cool with us, all right? Because we all we care about is the LTV, which is loan to value, which is asset based. Uh, we have another house at 111-41166 Street in Jamaica. Here's an interesting one. This lady lives in Georgia. However, she inherited the house when her it's her grandmother who left the inheritance. Now her grandmother died. Her grandmother had the mortgage. The mortgage company said that the borrower passed away. We're recalling the loan. She needs to grab the house from under the loan in order not to lose the house. Nobody's going to give her a loan in 30 days. So this is her approach. She's using us for the next six, seven months. Okay, we, got, we gave her money in three weeks. She's going to use that. She's going to move the house into the corporation again and get a refinance already under her name at a later date. Okay? So that's another one, you know, so you have an investor that's flipping, that's running thin, you have a foreign national, you have somebody who inherited. Uh, another house is 517 Bainbridge, that's in East New York. Um, another one, he's an investor, however, he started a renovation and he went under budget. This happens 99% of the time. Now, for those of you that know the rules of the banks, is if you started the renovation, they will not lend you in the middle of it. 
So you have, you have two opportunities to borrow from the bank, either before you start the renovation, from clean slate, or after you finish the renovation. There's no such thing in between. Okay? No bank will give you a loan in between. He thought he's, he'll be able to use his own funds and finish it. He ran under about a couple of hundred thousand dollars. He needed to finish it up. So his, his basic exit strategy is to refinance after he's done with the renovation. Mind you, this is, this is our temporary fixes. They do cost more than a regular lender, but it's something that gives you an opportunity to actually you know, exit out of it with, with money and, and profits. Okay? Um, so, Amanda gave me a little bit of an agenda, so I'm going to go over the agenda and make sure that you, I cover everything. So, what is hard money lending? So, basically, hard money lending is a niche provided for properties and borrowers, and this could be anyone and anything. There is no standard for hard money. Okay? It could be any person that's involved in real estate, and it could be any property that's involved in real estate. Okay? Um, some of the things that uh, hard money lenders are used for is maybe a bailout because somebody is late on payments. Now, if you're late on payments, you can't go and refinance okay? because everybody wants to see your last 12 months of payments. If you're in foreclosure, you cannot refinance. If your house, and this is more for investors, if you have a house that has violations, a bank will not close you with violations. A bank won't close you if you have a temporary CFO until you get the real one. They may close you with an escrow, but the escrow is so huge, you know what I'm saying, that it's not worth uh, refinancing. Um, that's on the property side. On the borrower side, it could be multiple issues. It could be your credit report, it could be your income, it could be your uh, naturalization status, it could, it could be a variety, okay? So again, anything and anyone could be qualified for hard money lending. And people, you know, sometimes don't even think about it. And they say, you know what, if I can't get it from the bank, I'm not going to do the deal. You as realtors can save a lot of deals like that. <clears throat> I always say to, to the realtors, not only do you save the deals, but you can also make a little extra on it. You know, sometimes a lot extra. It depends who your clients are and how you deal with them. Um, just one thing I want you to reiterate over and over. Hard money is a temporary fix. Usually hard money are anywhere from one year to three year tops. Um, majority of hard money guys would like to get their money back in one year. Okay? And whoever you speak to, whoever is trying to obtain hard money, they have to have a clear exit strategy. If the exit uh, strategy is not clear, it's not going to work out. It's going to work out in a bad way. They're going to go to another hard money lender and pay more interest and it's going to snowball where at, at one point or another they've paid so much money in closing costs and fees that they're going, their equity is going to be non-existent. It's almost not worth to keep the property. Okay? So just remember that. Um, so the other thing that uh, Amanda wanted to know is between hard money, what's the difference between hard money and traditional lending? I, I covered this a little bit. So basically Hard money is an industry that is not licensed, okay? We don't have any consumer protection. And the reason for it is because we do not give money to consumers. If you know that every property that we fund has to be moved from a personal name into either a corporation or an LLC. And whatever we fund is really not called a mortgage, even though they sign a mortgage paper, but it's called a business loan. So every hard money lender that you're going to go there is going to tell you, okay, we have a refinance or a purchase, it has to be closed in a corporate name. And it has, you have to sign a couple of papers where we'll say that this is a commercial loan and it's used for business purposes only and that it's non-owner occupied. So those are the criteria, major criteria in a hard money lender. You can't be an owner occupied, uh, it has to be for business purposes only and it's a commercial loan. Now. Um, you probably have heard a new term that came in into the business a few years back. It's called non-QM loans. Mm -hmm. You've heard of these? Yeah. Okay. So non-QM loans, they, they can lend to an individual, but they are protected by consumers.
consumer rights. So you have, in order to write a QR loan, you have to be licensed. Okay. So just just to give you uh, that information. Uh, as far as traditional lending right now, you know it's majority of banks that do it. It's basically, you know, qualifications of Fannie Mae and uh, it falls under, you have the criteria of jumbo loans and regular loans and what the rates could be and so on. You also have a, a credit score criteria. Where in hard money, we don't care about a credit score. You will see, if you do businesses with us, you'll see that we will run a credit report. However, the only reason we're running a credit report is because we want to know that there's no judgments or credit card debt that's, that's not being picked up on the title report. Okay, because the title report will not pick up certain credit card debts unless they already formed as judgments. And it won't pick up other things. So we run the credit report just for the debt purpose only. All right. Um, as far as portfolio lenders, today the non-QM loans really took over. For portfolio lenders. There's really not many portfolio lenders out there anymore. Um, there's very few. Right now you have basically vanilla loans, non-QMs, and then hard money. Those are the three phases right now of finance. Um, so what are some common terms an investor would require to meet in order to get a loan? A true hard money lender, what you need is an ID, an appraisal, and a title. So those are the three things. So the process is very simple. The process is when you reach out to a hard money lender, they're going to ask you for an application, and it's not a 1003. Okay, it's not the one that you get from the bank. It should be one pager, maybe one and a half, just to ask you your name, your phone number, your email. Very simple thing about yourself and the property. That's all it is. Um, do a credit report to make sure there's no judgments and do an appraisal. Because hard money is asset based, majority of hard money lenders will not lend over 65% of loan to value or 65% of the purchase price if it's a purchase, whichever is lower. So if somebody is calling me right now and says, oh, you know what, I have a workout that I did with a bank and I can buy this, right, at a reduced uh, number. Can you finance me 100% because I'm buying it for 35 cents under, under the value? We cannot do that, okay? We cannot do that. We need to make sure that 35%, whether it's a down payment or the equity, the borrower has what we call the skin in the game, okay? So it's very important. So all, the, all these uh, reduced mortgages or these workouts with the banks that they're doing, it's extremely hard to explain to the person that you still need to come up with the cash, okay? So that's, that's another thing. Um, what else do we have here, Amanda? Oh, <laughs> what does ARV, after repair value, mean and how would an agent investor calculate for this investment? So a lot of times with the fix and flips uh, or people that are acquiring properties who want to refinance and want to, let's say, fix up the property, what they'll do is they'll come in and say, you know what, my property is worth 500000 but when I finish renovating, it's worth 800000 so in these cases, we do allow a, an allowance for innovations, but it's done in two steps. The first step is, what is the property worth as is the way it sits today? So let's say the property is worth 500, like they mentioned. We'll give them 65% of that. Now they're telling me that it's going to be worth 800,000 after they renovate. We're going to ask them, what is their renovation budget? Because if their renovation budget is 300000 it doesn't make sense, right? So let's say their renovation budget is 100000 for argument, making numbers even. We'll give them another 65% of that 100000 but we'll give it to them in phases. So if, let's say, it's a $100,000 renovation, let them put in the first thirty-five, And when they put in thirty-five, we'll give them back, let's say, fifteen or twenty. Now they have more money to renovate, and it goes in stages until the end, okay? What this allows them to do is to also finance part of the renovation. And we know, because we do an inspection every time we give them a drawer, we know that this renovation actually was done. So this way we can be assured that our collateral is protected and they're not lying to us and saying, yeah, I did the work, okay? Because they can get invoices no problem today. So that's how the ARV works, okay? It's after renovation value. 
Uh, a lot of times when an investor comes in, uh, when we do an appraisal, if somebody's not asking for renovation allowance, we will do a straight appraisal. When they ask for renovation allowance, we ask the appraiser to do two, it's one appraisal with two values, one before, as is, and one after. Usually those appraisals cost a little bit more, so if let's say an average one family today appraisal is about $675, $650, so this may cost, let's say, another $150 to $200 more, because an appraiser has to find comps in a renovated, uh, in a renovated already renovated, and he also has to make an allowance. But in all cases, the appraiser will ask for a budget, because they want to make sure that the budget is realistic. Okay, that they're not under the budget, because if they're under a budget, we're going to be under water with them. And if they're over the budget, if we're not giving them enough, they're going to run out of money and go thin again. So that's what ARV means. Okay? Um, what, is, what defines a low, medium, and high risk? Okay, so a low risk to us is an investor that has a track record that's been doing this for many years, that bought, sold, renovated, whatever they're borrowing for, we want to make sure that they've done this before. So this is their main business. So to us, this is low risk because they know exactly what they're doing. They know how to manipulate with the building department. They know how to hire the right trades. They know what they need to do. You know what I'm saying? If you have a convertible one family, I call convertible, you know, putting a second kitchen in, you know you should rock that wall when the inspector comes, right? So you cannot screw the shit rock later. So we know these investors, they understand how to play the game, okay? Medium risk to us is um, investor that's basically dabbles in real estate, okay? He's done a couple of projects, he does it part-time, he's got another job or whatever, another business, and he does it like on the side as a real estate investor. That's to us as a medium risk because we've seen he's done it before, he's done it successfully, he doesn't have any foreclosures or late payments in the past, and we feel very comfortable with it. The high-risk people are usually the ones that need to either bail out, late on their payments, or already in a foreclosure, okay? So, in a real world, you have to be six months out of foreclosure in order to get regular financing. Uh, and you have to have 12 consecutive payments on time in order to get uh, regular financing. What we'll do is we'll finance in the midst of a foreclosure, we'll finance right at the auction. Okay? We have a property right now actually that we're looking at and the guy's auction is coming up. All right, so he needs to get it done now. So, in that case, we will still do it. But to us, that's high risk, which means it's a higher interest rate, higher points, higher everything, okay? Because we have to make sure. Sometimes when we see that it's really bad, we will lower our LTV to maybe even 55 or 50%, okay? And it's a choice that a borrower has, whether to take it or not. But we feel that um, today in New York, and we do New York and New Jersey. So today in New York, a commercial foreclosure could take somewhere in upwards close to two years. So just on a financial end of it, and you can figure this out, we charge anywhere between seven and a half and 12% annual interest rate. However, if you're in default, the default interest rate is 24%. So, if we give you 65% loan to value, we only have 35% left over to, to the top. If we're in foreclosure more than 18 months, we're basically at 36%. So we're above our money, okay? So we have to be very careful with that. So we, we have given extremely high risk money, but we've reduced the LTV to make sure that we can get out of this with our interest rate, okay? So that's, that's your answer to uh, low, medium, and high. Uh, what programs does Tower Fund Capital offer? Uh, we gave out the, the, the sheets with our own metrics, but I'm going to go over a couple of things that are, should be really important to you so you understand. Majority of people that you're dealing with are brokers. They're the brokers, or the, what's we call, you've heard the term correspondent lender? Okay. So there's, a couple of phases, or the different levels of, of lending in, in real estate. 
uh, on the bank side or even on the hard money side. So in the beginning, at the lower end, you have a broker. Basically, he goes out, he brokers the deal to the bank, to an investor, it doesn't matter who, it's not his money, he has no recourse whatsoever, you know, he just collected his points and he's gone. Then you have what's called a correspondent lender. A correspondent lender is basically a broker that writes the loan in his name, but uses the credit line from the bank, and at the table, he sells the loan to the bank. So he doesn't put any of his money in, okay? But what he does is he uses the bank's guidelines and he does the whole process of underwriting, processing, and everything else on his own. Okay, So he puts in the labor and the hours and the cost of obtaining the loan, of the acquisition cost. Okay, But what he does is at the table, he sells it directly to the bank. So when you're at the table, you'll see that the bank is actually writing the check. There's another thing what's called a wholesale lender. And a wholesale lender is the one that buys the money from the bank and lends it to you. Those guys have somewhat of a recourse to the bank. Uh, very minimal. In some cases it could be uh, you have no recourse if a borrower made only one payment. So if the borrower defaults on the first payment, you have to buy the loan. Okay? And we've seen cases like that. People borrow money in the first of the month, it's gone. So, um, you know, so that so the wholesale the wholesale also the difference uh, what they do their upper hand is that they make money on a spread. So they're offered money, let's say at five percent, they sell it to you for six percent. They'll make that one percent. They don't make it on a monthly basis or annual basis. What what bank does is they have a formula. So for every one percent that they upsell an investor or borrower, what they'll do is they'll give them let's say quarter of a point or half a point on top of their points. It's not like they have a residual income. It's just one-time fee, but that's what we call a spread, okay? Now, in our case, the way we work is actually our money. We're a private equity fund. We raise the money, and we're giving out our own money with a full 100% rewards. So every penny that we give you, I mean to your borrowers, we're responsible for. And if the loan goes bad, that's us, okay? What we did do in order to scale our business is we went out to a bank and asked for leverage. Okay? And basically it's the same thing that it works as a stock market when you get a margin, right? You get like a 4 to 1 margin or 2 to 1 margin. Same thing with us. We have a 3 to 1 margin. So we raise, let's say, if we raise $10 million, the bank gives us $40 million. We raise $20 million, they gave us $80 million. Okay? And that's how we make our money. We make our money based on what we have raised, plus the difference between what we buy on our what's called a revolver credit line, just like you would have, you know, for your uh, HELOC or anything else, or any credit business credit line or personal credit line, and um, and that's that's how we make money. But we take all the risk, and we take all the labor and underwriting and processing. So one of the advantages that you have is to deal with a company that actually uses their own money. Okay? So when we come to the closing table, you will see that this is our check that's being written at the closing. The way we recap our money is that once we gave the borrower the money, we go to the bank and ask them to refund us X amount of percentage on the hedge, on the leverage, I'm sorry, on the leverage. Um, the other thing that's important is that You've probably noticed that sometimes when you speak to uh, a broker or a, a mortgage uh, salesperson, he always tells you, "I gotta speak to my processor, I gotta speak to my underwriter, yeah. uh, I gotta speak to my appraiser, I gotta speak to this, this, this." In our company, there's only one phone number, and it's reached to me. So I'm your processor, I'm your underwriter. I make the decision, and the reason for it is because if I'm responsible to my investors for the money. And I'm personally responsible. I want to make sure that I have a hold on everything. Okay. Uh, plus the size and the amount of deals that we do, I can still have people help me, but I make the ultimate decision. So I look at every single loan myself. When you guys <coughs> call us with a scenario, I will be talking to you. I will be telling you if this is a go or not. And uh, basically, you have an answer instantaneously. You'll, you'll know instantaneously if it's a no-go, that's for sure, <laughs> okay? 
but uh, it, most probably you'll know with, within hours if it's a go or not. Okay? Um, we've been in the business since 1986, 1985, I'm sorry. So I've been on a real estate end. I was an agent, I was a broker, I, was, I owned the mortgage company. We actually were the warehouse company for the mortgage company. So we dealt with Wells Fargo, with the, we have Wells Fargo credit lines, we have Bank of New York credit lines. So we did that. I know the titles because we own the title company. Um, again, I've been in every aspect of this business. So uh, even if you have a real estate issue or a title issue and we are your lender, you can always approach us and we will fix this for you. You know, uh, sometimes you get things, uh, you know, you have, you have estates where siblings are fighting. You know, how do you have to work out a title issue? Uh, we just had a title that missed a uh, chain. You guys familiar with the title chains? Yeah. So we just had a title that missed a chain. What they did was they transferred the deed, but they never insured it. The title company transferred the deed, but they were cheap enough <laughs> not to insure it. You know, they saved a couple of thousand dollars, but not a bit of an ass. So, you know, so we can fix that for you. We know exactly how to do it. What we had to do is we had to actually unwind that title, return it to the first position, reinsure it, and then reinsure it again. Okay? Took about a week to do, but you know what you do. I mean, in, in Queens and Brooklyn, it's fine. When you get to Nassau and Suffolk, you can't do this so fast. For those of you that don't know, the searches in Nassau and Suffolk may take up to a month. So it's not us. We'll give you the loan now. You know, once the appraiser comes in, we're ready to close. So when it's Nassau and Suffolk, we usually order title at the time that we take an application to save time, okay? Because searches, like I said, two, three weeks, you know, they're not online. Uh, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. Uh, the other thing that I can promise you is that if we issued you a commitment, you're going, you're going to close. The only thing that can screw it up is title. And that's something I can't guarantee, something I can't promise because I haven't seen it. A lot of times, good attorneys have title already ordered even before you guys get to, to us, which is great. Okay, then we can take a look at it and issue a commitment already without any title issues. Okay? From the phone call to the commitment, it's 24 to 48 hours. I won't take longer than that. Um, <clears throat> A lot of times uh, when people come to finance, their loan to value doesn't work. It's higher. There's less equity than they would expect. Maybe because of the appraisal, maybe because they borrowed too much and whatnot. So we are one of the companies that what we'll do is we'll do a cross collateral. So if you have other properties out there, we will cross collateralize against them in order to get you to your loan to value number that you need. Mm -hmm. Assuming they have something, <laughs> you know, if you're totally tapped out, no, nobody's helping <laughs> you. Um, I'll start to close is 10 business days, and that's if everything is running smooth. So if I get all the paperwork in time, appraiser too, it takes about five business days. We use independent appraisers, they're not in-house, we can't use in-house because we need a totally independent appraiser. All of our appraisers are certified. Uh, if it's uh, not in, the, in, let's say, Brooklyn and Queens, and uh, <clears throat> we, we'll use a national company. Uh, if it's Brooklyn and Queens, we'll use a local company that we've been using for a long time. Um, loans over a million dollars, we require two appraisals, however, uh, the way we do it is we do one full appraisal and one what's called a recertification, which is another $150 to $200. It doesn't hurt the borrower, but we just need to make sure that, you know, yeah. it's there. Um, we'll do as low as $80,000. we will do as high as $2 million. We will not go over $2 million with our own money. However, we do have other outlets that we can take the loan over $2 million but that's a different procedure, okay? So I'm just gonna talk for what we can do. We'll do anything under $2 million. Um, rather than me speaking about 
<laughs> I guess I've covered a lot, no? Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, you guys, I, I would rather do this uh, interaction as well. Um, you, you, you want me to talk about how you can monetize on this? And yes. then I'll take questions? Yes. 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 Sounds great. Okay. So we treat every agent, real estate agent, as our salesperson. There's All Keith. right. <laughs> it's Keith. <laughs> it's Keith. It's my boy Keith. So this guy just referred me a deal. He is from Entrance One Realty in Queens. He referred me a deal for $850,000 loan, $17,000 commitment. I asked him for this picture. I asked him with a check because I know some people won't believe it. So um, here's how we work. Very simple. The lender has its fees. The lender has its point. The lender has its interest rates. You guys become our salespeople. You fill out a small application so we can hire you. You fill out a W-9 so we can pay you. And basically, you build your points as you please. Okay? What you have in your hands is our own matrix. So this is, this is the money that we need. This is the interest that we need. These are the points that we need. Everything else on top of that, you're more than welcome to it. So he, he charged two points on this deal. At 850,000, two percent, 17,000. What's nice about this deal is that if you were to sell a million dollar property, you guys probably would make around 15 to 20 thousand dollars, depending on where you are in sports. Okay, some companies would make a little more, but that's really this gives you close to a double of, of your income or stream if you really want this. Right? And it doesn't have to be only on your own deals. It, has to, it can be on any deals. Sometimes you know people are not selling, they're refinancing. But if you know that they're refinancing and they need services of a company like us, this is really how you monetize on it. So <clears throat> just to give you um, a little bit of a... We, as non-consumer pro uh, product company, do not have usury laws. There's no such thing as usury law. So we can charge anything we want. It doesn't matter. Just like fraction companies uh, are charging, you know, 40% uh, a year of restaurants, you know, through their uh, merchant services and stuff like that. We don't have to. But there is a good uh, rule of thumb of doing business, you know, where you don't look like a shyster. <laughs> <laughs> when you actually do good business. We prefer that our all fees together do, are not more than five points on top of the loan. This is our preference. We feel that this is something that we owe not only to you, to us, but also to the consumer, to the borrower. Okay? You don't you want him to walk out with his head holding high from a closing table and not feel like, you know, he has to walk like this. Right? So uh, we, we just want to make sure that uh, five five points all around. The lender takes two, so you have the scope of zero to three. Okay, um, it's fine. Uh, so anytime you have a deal, this is the procedure. You email me, you say, here, I have a deal. What do you think? If I tell you, go for it, you have an application, you have your borrower fill out an application, you send it back to me. This is where it stops until I issue a commitment. I do not interact with your borrowers unless you want me to. I'm not looking to take your deals away. I'm not looking to talk to them. I don't need that. Okay? Um, so what we'll do is we'll send you the commitment. On the commitment, they will say your name and it will state your broker's commission. So everything they know from day one, what you're making, what we're making, what our fees, what is the interest rate, what is the term of the loan, and so on. Okay? Uh, it has your phone number, not ours. I mean, uh, the, the letter has, has our phone numbers, but where it says broker, it has your phone number, your email, your name, and so on. And once we have a commitment, then I will send you and say, I need these five documents. Basically, I need from you about five or six documents for you to come back, and let me tell you what they are. It's very simple. I need a credit report. I need an application. The appraisal form, they need to fill out, so this way I can order an appraisal. They pay the appraiser directly. So we, we, want, we did it this way purposely because we don't want them to think that we're making money on the appraisal. Okay, because some companies make money on auxiliary uh, uh, stuff like credit reports and appraisals and stuff like that. We don't want to do that. That's not our business. Our business is points and interest. 
That's all. That's how we make money, and that's how we like to make money, okay? We don't want to dip into your pocket, their pocket, and whatnot. So they pay their appraisal directly. As far as, as far as the credit reports, we don't run credit reports. We allow you to run a credit report, or they can run their own credit report. The only thing we ask for is it's a triple merge, and it's, if possible, to be run through Identity IQ. Why do we choose Identity IQ? For one reason. You can open up an account, run your credit report, and close it, and it's free. Okay, so it doesn't cost them 30 or 40 or 50 dollars for the credit report. And it's a triple merge, and it's a good one. So we can utilize that. So you can run it on their behalf if you like full servicing them, or they can run it on their own and send me the PDF of it. Once I have that and the appraisal is ordered, it's a waiting game for five days. After that, we order title and we close. If there is a time constraint, we'll order title at the, at the time of the application. Now, there's, there's a fee of $995, which is an application fee. That fee is fully refundable if we cannot close the loan for, because we did something and unable. If it's their choice that they don't want to close the loan, that fee is not refundable. It's basically paying for our labor, okay, that's, that's the work that we do, okay? So they're paying that also via credit card. You don't have to touch their money. We send them the link or we send you the link. You can forward it to them. You can use their credit card. Again, however you guys, it all depends what are you going to do. Are you going to create yourself as a full service and make this a business? Or this is going to be a side business for you as an auxiliary income to your real estate commissions? Either way works for us, it's whatever your preference is. We don't push it either way. Okay? And that's it. And once at the closing, you have a couple of choices. You can come to the closing, or I can deposit money into your bank account. That's one of the services that I provide. <laughs> <laughs> I go to your bank and do a direct deposit, I take a picture of the check, and I text you. Okay? He does. He does. <laughs> he does. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's one of the services that I provide, you know, other, other than if your bank is... And the first day. <laughs> yeah, thanks, lovely. <laughs> you know, so so that's about it. So the commitments, the decisions are instantaneous. The closings are simple. Uh, we have we we sent all the documents before the closing so the attorney and the bar can review them. So when they come to the closing table, they have no questions. There shouldn't be any questions whatsoever. We give them the closing statement to the penny, other than maybe a couple of hundred dollars off. Because in the morning when you close, title is going to run what's called a continue, a continuous of title to see if there's anything else. So there could be discrepancy in the per diem interest, could be discrepancy in the water bill, a tax bill, you know. So those things come up, but they're usually, you know, peanuts. Yeah. Okay, and that's it, and that's how we do it. Okay, we have an attorney uh, that's representing our company. We've done a lot of closings by mail. So a lot of times when you have an out of towner or you have somebody who doesn't have the time to cut out from their business or their work, we'll do, we'll, we'll do uh, closing by mail. Okay. We'll basically send all our documents to their attorney, the attorney gets them to sign, he sends it, the attorney sends it to the title company, we send the money to the title company and they finalize the transaction. Makes it very safe, very fast and you know, nobody has to take time for work. Okay? So we will bend backwards. For anything that you need, with within reason, but uh, and so on. I also wanted to say thank you to Alex and Amanda. <laughs> guys, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, and I'll take questions or scenarios. If you guys want to shoot scenarios or questions, please, I'll be more than happy to answer. I feel like I needed to grab a notepad before this. I didn't realize how much like. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I blow up. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, anybody, anything? Side and also get paid on the broker side if we're helping the buyout? Yeah, so, so here's the thing. Uh, when, back, when I was in the business, I had a disclosure. Okay. So I gave my, uh, I, I gave my, uh, I gave my clients a disclosure. So if you do full disclosure, basically, I mean, you're in the real estate business, you know what the disclosures are. Yeah. Right? There's those things you get charged $10,000 <laughs> for. <laughs> uh, so you can, do, you can do a disclosure which says, I'm a real estate agent, I'm also representing you in a financial transaction mm -hmm. of obtaining a loan. Okay? It's uh, not a problem. However, it's not necessary, and the reason for it is because the client is an entity. Okay. Okay? So it's not necessary, but if you want to cover yourself from all the sides, 
please do. I have no problem with it. The way, the only reason I can pay you guys a commission is because it's a commercial loan. If this was a consumer loan or if this was a mortgage to an individual, I would not be able to pay your commission. So on non-QM deals or vanilla loans that you're going through the banks, you can't collect the commission unless you have the NMLS number. So the only reason we can actually pay this legally and we actually advertise it is for that reason. Is that it's a commercial loan from an entity, not a consumer. And so agents like Keith, or people like Keith, they just advertise this as like a part of a list of their services that they offer? You know what, some do. Some actually put us, you know, on a sign off on, on a bottom, you know, if they need something, uh, you know, I can get you a mortgage and stuff like that. S s different people do it different ways, you know what I'm saying? Like, like you and my son are doing Instagram, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so you guys are, are good on social media, you know. For me, it's tough, so um, it, it all depends. It's whatever marketing techniques you have and whatever you can, you can, uh, basically get your borrower and however you guys acquire your clients or customers, that's fine. That's fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with offering this kind of uh, services. Okay? You explained before um, low risk, medium risk and high risk. Um, you did, I don't know if you did, but did you mention if, if it's someone's first time, are they considered high risk? No. No? No. High risk is only the people that are in trouble. Okay. We'll consider them high risk. Medium risk are the ones that are doing it first time or first couple of times, and low risk are the ones that are doing it all the time. You know, so uh, and sometimes with high risk, we'll, we'll do differently. Like we know, let's say we know that somebody is chronic in payments, right? Like they don't know how to manage their money; they're not going to pay. So let's say they have a good amount of equity in the house. What we'll offer them is we'll say to them, you know what? And they ask, let's say it's a million dollar property. They ask for half a million. We'll tell them, you know what? Why don't you take six hundred? instead of half a million, we will credit the difference to the first year's payments. We will take your payments up front. You don't have to pay it for one year. And then you exit out of it. If they exit out of it before that, we will reimburse them for the month they haven't used. But at least they don't have to worry about not paying us. And when they go now to refinance, they, uh, usually the new bank asks for the, the record. What we do is we put in our mortgage that they prepaid us for X amount of months. So instead of showing them the payments, they can say, I prepaid my mortgage payment. And that would count as a payment on time. Okay? So we've, we've done that actually with an Australian uh, guy on, on Union Street. That's how we did it. He prepaid one year up front. Okay? Because his uh, uh, equity allowed him to do that. And it worked out, and uh, he knew that from uh, Australia he won't be able to, you know, send me the checks every month. Yeah. You know, because what we do is we do an ACH. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have a bank account here, so that's it. So that's how we did it. So there's a lot of ways to do it. You know, I'm saying to show them that actually the payments are made. Yeah. You said Keith. I'm sorry. You said Keith um, made two points. Do you want us discussing points with the clients, or is that something you, 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 don't, you don't have to? You can quote them already a, a full deal. Okay. You can quote them. Let's say let's say rate seven and a half percent and four points. You know the two points being taken by the lender, two points being taken by you. Okay. So you don't have you don't have to discuss with them, but they're gonna see it. So I believe it's better to prevent the fight than put it out. Mm -hmm. I would definitely do it, and there's not, I don't think it's anything in, in of an embarrassment for you to earn a living by providing yeah. service, you know. You, you tell your listings that they're going to charge you 5%. So yeah, 100%. I would, look, I believe in full disclosure. That's how you get, you know, you don't get into trouble, you know, and I believe in tracing everything with emails and documents. Like, I have them sign a commitment. Now, sometimes people say, oh, I don't have to sign a commitment. Yeah, no, I want you to sign a commitment because that's where the terms are. So if, let's say, we come to the closing table and you say, well, you know what, you promised something else, well, really, here it is. Mm. That's it. I think disclosure is the best. Um, since, oh, I'll, I'll just go ahead because I'll talk about it. Ladies first. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that if you are going to take out hard money for a property and then do renovations and use hard money to help with the renovations. Since it's on like a case-by-case -case basis, is someone able to 
not negotiate, but like, do they have leeway with you to say like, oh, I would need more than 15000 for the first round after I give my round? Or is it like a strict payment? No, deal? it's never strict. This is basically you coming to a boutique. Okay. You know, you're not coming to a supermarket. You're coming to a boutique <laughs> and you say, you know what? Because sometimes somebody will say to me, you know what? I can't make a 10% payment. I can make an 8% payment. Would you mind taking the other 2% at the end of the game? Of course. Okay. As long as I have my LTV, I don't mind taking it at the end. I can wait for it. You know what I'm saying? I just want them. Our biggest, our biggest concerns are very simple. That they can make their payments. Because if they can't make their payments, how are they going to repay it? And that they have a clear exit strategy. And if they don't, we'll help them with a the, with the clear exit strategy. Okay, it's part of our job. Uh, and the reason for it is because we actually don't own their property. We want the money. We want the money back so we can turn it next time, right? And the sooner they pay us, the better we are off because every time we turn, we charge points, we charge fees, right? So we make more money. It's like, you know, driving a cab. Yeah. The more stops you make, the more money you make, right? You don't make on a long trip. You make on short ones. So this is the same thing. So we want our money back and we want to make it as easy as possible for them to pay you in here and to pay back to us. So if let's say somebody came to us and they're in trouble and they need, um, let's say, fix their credit, we'll point them in the right direction to an agency that will fix their credit. And some of the agencies vary from 30 days to not to about nine months. You know, it depends how bad it is. But we can fix with fixed credits in three to four weeks, and we fix them. You know, it took about nine months to a year. So it, it happens. Okay, you never know. But at least we, if we can be in control. Well, let's say you have. Um, you have a problem right now. I don't know if you guys heard of it. Bank statement programs. You've heard of it? <clears throat> so non-QM loans and some portfolio lenders came out with a program that's called a bank statement. So you need a minimum credit score of I think of about 580, which is low. Yeah. But what you need is you need 24 months of bank statements to show an average deposits. And what they'll do is they'll take an average deposit over 24 months and they'll divide it in half. And that half is what you can afford on payments. Got it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So sometimes we will say to a person and say, okay, you need half a million dollars on, on a regular mortgage, 6%, let's say, right? Five, half a million dollars is about $3,000 a month, right? Something along those lines. So we need you to make deposits, let's say, on a safe side, let's say, 7000 8000 a month. Okay, we'll give you a two-year loan for two years, borrow from your friends, I don't care where you borrow from, put in $8,000, take out, put in, take out, put in, take out. If I can prove the deposits of $8,000 for 24 months, I'll get you out of this deal at about, like I just got somebody the same uh, program, five, 595, a, a touch under six, okay? No docs, two things, credit over 580, <clears throat> and uh, 24 months. Now they have right now also 12 month bank program, but that rate is about seven, about seven percent, I think, seven and a quarter, something like that. Okay. So we have resources to take the borrower and exit him out. You know. But once you become our salespeople, basically what we'll do is we'll teach you that stuff as well, so you can maybe double up on your income. You know what I'm saying? You can bring them in first, collect and take them out to another lending institution and make another point or so, you know. So it's, one thing I can tell you is this, anybody who borrowed money, hard, anybody who borrowed hard money before is a comeback customer. <laughs> because they either always invest or they never learn. So either <laughs> way, so either way they keep on borrowing. It's a safe, in this business it's great, you acquire it once, it's a lifelong relationship. You know what I'm saying? So just trust me. Anybody who's back on his payments, he'll, he'll go back on it as well. Again, anybody who's investing, he will keep on investing. He'll come back to you because he knows it's an easy process. It's a little costly, no question about it, but it's easy. You know, you're dealing with a person, not a machine. You, you have the money in 10 days. It's a good thing. Okay, so just one thing. If you guys acquire these customers, you'll have them for life. Um, do you have copies of disclosures and all that stuff? If anyone's been sent up? I can get your copy. We, we don't do it, but I can get I can get your copy of disclosure. Okay. I can I'll have my attorney set it up and as a courtesy I'll give it to you guys. Oh thank all you. Alright, sure. Anything else? Any other questions? No?
Let's party. That was, that was great. Thank All right. you. Thank you so much.